So, morning. Clayshire Johnson starts off with a beautiful video showing us the, the iX3. I'll, I'll take one in black. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. Me too. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Clayshire. Welcome. Good morning, Clayshire. Thank you. Always great to chat to you guys. Oh, fantastic to have you here. We, we've been obviously hearing a lot about uh, people talking about the OEMs and, and, and the, what are the OEMs doing. And I, I think for us, it's a, it's a great privilege to have middle of day two as we're talking about the future of, of mobility from a South African context. Um, one of South Africa's leading OEMs when it comes to the electric movement, uh, BMW. So I'm really excited. You know, your, your topic is the future is electric. I think that's, a, that's more of a statement than a question mark. Um, and having someone who has your background, your knowledge, your expertise yes. uh, talk us through it, I think it would be, it, it's, it's really exciting to hear. So I think myself and Devon are going to get out the way and let you, let, let you take us through it. Um, and we're going to just field a whole bunch of questions, which I know we're going to get from people. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll fire them at you when we have an opportunity. Sure. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Take it away, Glacier. Great. Hi, everyone. So today I just wanted to obviously just do a little bit of an introduction. So my name is Klesha Johnson and I basically head up electromobility um, and what we call shared mobility solutions at BMW Group South Africa. Um, and today the main objective really is to share with you what BMW is doing, why sustainability is really so important to us and what does the future really look like. Um, and when I talk about this, I'm not talking about it from a global perspective, from a European perspective, but really also in South African context, because uh, electric is here and we want to get as many people on board as possible. So it's very exciting. It's a, it's a great space to be in. And really for us, just as a little bit of an introduction, mobility is really the core of modern civilization. So the way that people move and goods move impact many aspects of life. In the next 20 years, we'll actually see significant changes as elect electrification, shared mobility, vehicle connectivity, and eventually autonomous vehicles start to reshape the automotive sector as well as logistics sectors all around the world. So technology is really at the core of this transition, but there are a lot of other factors that play an important role. So for example, um, the policymakers right now are driving the automotive sector towards this low carbon, uh, low carbon options, as well as improved fuel efficiency, right? You also start to see a lot of countries that are competing when it comes to building the next clusters of high value industry. And also you start to see uh, automotive manufacturers and large fleet operators taking long-term decarbonization targets a lot more seriously. So while this is happening, on the other hand, you also have urbanization that's continuing around the world. And that really still has increased concerns when it comes to congestion, urban air quality, and as well as con changing uh, consumer preferences. You also then start to see trends such as battery prices starting to decrease, policy pressures starting to increase in many markets. And then you also start to see a lot of new EV uh, products and services uh, offered within these various markets as well. We know that COVID-19 affected a lot of industries, a lot of businesses, um, including the automotive sector in 2020. So um, we, I mean, globally, the automotive sector felt that as well. Um, but what this does also start to bring about is these difficult questions that we need to start asking in terms of continuous investment in this transition. So you need to continuously invest in order to really build it up. And the fact is, is that, yes, the long-term trajectory doesn't necessarily change, but we anticipate that the market is going to be a bit of a bumpy ride for the next three years. And what you will really start to see is the difference in EV adoption from market to market. Um, and uh, there'll be a bigger gap between the more developed markets versus the markets that are still quite developing. So if we start to look at a little bit of the stats, and I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of these. So um, for example, here we've got Bloomberg as well. So um, 
Bloomberg, what Bloomberg is really saying, and this is something that a lot of um, the, the researchers are echoing, is that by 2025, 10% of the global passenger vehicle sales will be electric cars. And when you get to 2030, that will increase to 28%. And by 2040, it will be 58%. That is a massive massive number so the fact is is that yes we'll see a lot of this we know we know china is obviously leading the market followed by europe the states as well um there's a lot of early uh, adopters that are happening there there's a there's a lot of also local manufacturing within those markets as well there's a lot of policies in places within these markets and that was really the tipping point for a lot of them but what you're going to start seeing is that policy support is is a major major requirement um and I see it's echoing in a lot of the presentations that have taken place before me, and I continue to echo that sentiment as well, is the policy and, and uh, government really starting to change some of these structures to support a lot of these, um, what of these OEMs are wanting to bring in will really be the tipping point for this market as well. You also need to start looking at charging infrastructure, availability, um, most people are actually not aware of how much charging infrastructure there actually is um, in the markets. And most people are actually surprised when they realize um, how much there is in the market and how it's going to continue to grow. So that's, that is something that, that is taking place. It's probably just a, a education and a visibility um, part that needs to be focused on um, and then obviously we we really start to see so what they're actually saying is is really when you start to get to this 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 2030 mark is you're actually going to start to see this decline in combustion engines and obviously the the increase in in evs which is um, very interesting so if we go to the next slide Right, so understanding the numbers, and this is really starting to look more from a South African context and really starting to understand what is happening in our market right now. So um, where are most of the CO2 emissions really coming from? So we see that uh, the transport sector makes up about 10% of that. And um, within this 10%, we, uh, the automotives from a light um, passenger vehicle perspective actually make up the most, most of that actually. So, um, yes, they're predicting that this will obviously uh, start to gradually increase, but that is more from the fact that this is a developing market more than um, anything else. We also can see in terms of past that the sales of electric vehicles have been quite low. There's obviously less OEMs that are, that are selling vehicles in the market right now. Um, but I think this will also change more and more um, as as OEMs continue to lobby with governments. Um, I mean, I sit on, on the NAMSA committee as well. Um, and, and we really starting to see a lot of the OEMs really sitting and saying, how do we actually boost this industry? It's not necessarily about this OEM versus the next, but about the industry as a whole. And how do we really start to make sure that both public and private sector are working together. So from a BMW perspective, and I'll start from a global standpoint and then go or work down into a local one. So uh, we follow what we call strategy number one next. And really what this looks, looks at is it's really saying that from a BMW perspective, we want to inspire people on the move and we really want to shape tomorrow's individual premium mobility. So from a, a vision perspective and what is it that we stand for, and it's really about mobility, right? So we want to be part of people's mobility, right? We want to create this excitement, but we, we need to make sure that we are responsible as well. Um, and we really have this emotional connection when it comes to the products and the services that we offer our customers. We also want to make sure that um, 
we leverage, we continue to work on technologies, including the battery technologies over the years as well, and really starting to deliver these unique customer experiences. And, and lastly, when we start to look at obviously a corporate culture, it's really just about the fact that we try to create this culture where um, fresh thinking is encouraged. Um, we, we, it's, it's okay to, to test and, and try new things as well. Um, not all the time, <laughs> it doesn't always work out, but I mean, the fact is, is that it's great and that's what we work on and that's the type of culture that you want because you, that's how you continue to strive forward, right? So if you go to the next slide. So from a European perspective, just to put it into context from a BMW perspective. So we're saying that by 2021, which is this year, 25% of uh, the vehicles within the European markets will be electric. So our target for 2025 will be 33%. And by 2030, we are wanting 50% of the vehicles within the European market to be electric. Yes, that picture does look a little bit different um, in South African context, but the, the main idea here is the fact that we are investing heavily into electric vehicles, and this is going to happen all over the world. So not just in Europe or in the States or in China, but here in South Africa as well. One thing that people um, also tend to forget is that BMW has been manufacturing electric vehicles for a very long time. We built the first electric car in 1969 with the BMW uh, 1602. And that was the first electric vehicle that we, that we ever made. So we've been working on battery technology for a very long time. So, I mean, after that, we had the BMW E1 that came in 1991. We then had the Mini E. I don't know um, who was fortunate enough to see some of them running around SA as well. We had quite a few that we were testing. And this was, this was some time ago, even before we started selling the i3s and i8s. Um, we've then also been working on the Active E technologies as well since 2010. And then the BMW i3 came in. Uh, 2013 within the South African market, it was 2015, and then the BMW i8 um, as well. So we've been in this game for a while, we've been working on our technology for a long time. But the fact is that it's it's not just about selling cars. Um, so if you just go to the next slide. So for us, we really take um, sustainability very seriously. It is at the core of our values and we really start to look at it all across the chain. So from supply chain to production to use phase as well. So our target is actually to reduce uh, CO2 per vehicle by 20% um, by 2030. Um, which is a really, really big target because we've been working with a lot of our suppliers, a lot of the people that make the components, um, you know, how are they doing it? Are they using solar? Uh, how do we work together to really make sure that we decrease the CO2 per vehicle from production um, and not necessarily um, so all the way from supply chain in terms of how they're making the components all the way to production. So from a production perspective, uh, we want to decrease uh, by 80% per vehicle by 2030, which is, is it's a nice big target. And then from a use phase perspective, um, by 40%. And I'll just show you some more detail on that. So from a supply chain perspective, when we really start to look at um, how do we do this? So like I said earlier, we're trying to identify the most effective levers in terms of reducing the CO2. We are looking at obviously promoting a lot of green power. I mean, we saw um, our colleagues uh, earlier um, talking about uh, solar. So we also try to push that as well with our component manufacturers, the raw materials, and really starting to look at, um, you know, how do we make these processes more sustainable? From a production perspective, we really start to look at how do we actually reduce the heating needs by reusing a lot of the waste and processes and obviously closing a lot of those thermal cycles. We use a lot of data analytics on the machinery. 
um, to also reduce a lot of the power consumption of the machines um, and obviously um, minimizing the amount of scrap parts that we have. And then from a production perspective as well is we just need to make sure that we, doing, we are doing what is responsible um, in terms of what it is that we can control, right? From a use case perspective, so yes, we want you to have delivered more than 7 million electric vehicles by 2030. I think it's doable. Um, that's obviously a, a global number. Um, we also want to make sure that we contribute with efficient dynamics and that the fact that with the further increase in, in electric driving in terms of what our product offering actually is, that people really have this power of choice and it's something that we really punch is the power of choice. So. The fact is that whether you choose to drive electric, um, there, there's no, um, just lost my word, there's, you, you're not compromising on the driving pleasure that you basically have with your normal BMW. So um, the fact is, is in terms of the products that we're offering, you can barely tell the difference in terms of performance and the actual drive and the feel of the car um, when it comes to driving electric as well. And that was very important for us, but also allowing this customer the power of choice in terms of what it is that they want. So when we start to look at uh, the local market, it's really important to understand. So yes, there's a lot of policies. Um, I specifically want to zoom in on the green transport strategy because a lot of the, a lot of other policies, um, both internationally and nationally, actually um, helped to make the green transport strategy. I know that there was the automotive master plan um, that was also released last year. But a lot of these policies are really starting to talk to the same thing. Um, the master plan really looks more from a, a production and, and developing and um, starting to produce a lot of stuff here locally. Um, whereas I think the green transport strategy really starts to look at it holistically. So they look at all forms of travel. Um, but it's really, really important um, to understand it because obviously it comes from a lot of the, the public transport strategy, the national strategy for sustainable development, uh, electric vehicles, industry uh, roadmap. So that comes from NAMSA because I'm, I'm a NAMSA member as well. I'm actually the vice chair. Um, and then from an international perspective, looking at the UN, the Paris Agreement. So uh, we've made our um, commitments from a Paris Agreement perspective as markets. And how is it that we are going to accomplish this? And really the how was where the green transport strategy came in. Next slide. There we go. So when we start to look at, at the green transport strategy, I think it's really important because this is where you'd really start to see a lot of stakeholders working together. So we are aware of what the targets are. Um, in terms of the uptake of electric vehicles, hybrid cars, we know that from a green transport strategy perspective, even from a government fleet, they have a target in terms of starting to introduce a lot of electric vehicles into the fleet. Um, we're starting to look at a lot of offers from the EV manufacturing incentives perspective. So um, there is also a big difference in terms of the OEMs that actually manufacture in the market versus those that import into the market um, because there's different duties um, incentives, rebates, all those sorts of things that would affect uh, the end price to the customer. There's the EV industry roadmap, which is uh, led by the DTI. There, um, there's also a roadmap of proposed incentives um, from NAMSA, where the OEMs really start to sit together and say, how do we really drive this industry? Um, they, I know that the DTI has also been looking in terms of retrofitting a lot of EV tech um, and looking with local research institutions um, into, you know, EV batteries, um, storage usage, disposal. Um, Iwasa is also busy with the policy at this point in time in terms of the disposal of e-waste. Um, so there's quite a lot of these things that are happening in parallel. So... And then lastly, obviously just looking at incentives. So what incentives are in place, not just from a, a customer perspective, but from OEMs who import to OEMs that manufacture, and how do we really start to boost this uh, as an industry? Because to be honest, from a South African perspective, we're gonna have a lot of pressure 
from a lot of the other global markets when it comes to what we offer within the market because you'll actually start to see this phase out of of diesel engines globally and that will eventually hit us as well and you we remember that we import a lot of stuff um a lot of these vehicles so I mean, it's great. Um, I saw the gentleman earlier in terms of the, the locally made uh, Bucky, the M1B, if I got your name correctly. So it's exciting to start to see that um, you, you know, it's, it's not just about international versus local, but really starting to boost this industry and starting to change mindsets, the fact that it is possible. Um, so it's, it's really great to see a lot more people really coming on board um, with that. So let's get into a little bit of the exciting parts. <laughs> so from a South African lineup, um, for those who have been following or those who don't, yes, there's a lot of vehicles that are offered internationally. Um, not all of them we've brought into the market. Uh, the business cases didn't always um, make sense to really bring a lot of these cars in. Um, so this is just a little bit of a look. So we've had the BMW i3, Sure, we've had the i3 in the stable for some time now. It's actually gone through two battery upgrades. We started with the 60 amp um, back about five years ago. We then increased and improved the battery technology, it then went up to a 94 amp battery. Um, and we now have the 120 amp batteries um, in the i3s and the i3s as well. We then have the IAT Roadster and Coupe that we offer um, within the market as well. So these are on, on, are on run out at the moment. We also offer the BMW X5 xDrive 45e, great car. If you've ever had the opportunity to drive it, I think our hybrid, our plug-in hybrid technology has come a really, really long way. Um, I've been working for the brand for, for a long time. So it's really great to see where the battery technology has come from and experience that. And you get into one of these cars uh, now and it's, it's, it's just mind blowing, especially for somebody who has a passion for it really. We then have the seven series plug-in hybrid that we offer within the market as well. At the end of last year, we launched the mini SE, uh, very exciting. Um, that one is really exciting because this was, it's the latest battery technology and you can see it, it charges faster, it's quicker. Um, I mean, we know that the torque is instant. Um, electric cars are, are very quick off the line as well. So you really start to see that, um, not just in terms of how we were changing the batteries, but actually starting to experience it in person. And that really makes, it, makes a big change. So what's coming? So we will see the BMW iX. I am personally very excited about this car. <laughs> I, I, I really am. Um, so, I mean, here we're looking at about a range of, of 600 kilometers for the, the, the fast charging. I mean, we're talking 10 to, to 80 percent in, in less than 40 minutes as well. Uh, 370 kilowatts um, off of the all-wheel drive as well. So after that, not too long after that, uh, we will see the iX3. Um, uh, I showed a video on this a little bit earlier, uh, and this one is really just the core of that power of choice. So from an X3 perspective, really in the market, you, the customer has the power of choice. Um, and they would be able to decide if they would want a uh, combustion engine or electric, and it will be competitive as we start to move the, move the market over more and more. And here we're looking at about a range of 460 kilometers which is very impressive and then i know there's quite a few people that are quite excited about bringing the i4 not too long after that so yeah this is the the lineup from a south african perspective we know that it, it really just helps from a reduction in emissions perspective we know that the cost of ownership of these vehicles um, is a lot lower because you have fewer working parts than a combustion engine um, and therefore low wear and tear uh, so we're quite excited to to bring these electric vehicles um, into the market so I'm just going to go to the last slide just to finish off before we start taking some questions. 
So this for us is really the key considerations when it comes to the success of electric vehicles in South Africa. We've been lobbying for a very long time. We're involved in a lot of committees. Um, so this is this is really just our take. So really just from a product offering perspective, making sure that uh, we have a customer centric business approach. This really comes down to this power of choice. Right. So having the right vehicles for the market, making sure the range is there as well. Um, and really from a BMW, a complete BMW segment offering, right? So from an entry level to a top level so that it's not only just for the elite, but starting to bring a little bit more pricing competitive vehicles as well. Second life battery projects. So our batteries, uh, and we've been working on battery technology for a long time, as I've mentioned. So we're really starting to look at, um, you know, what do you do with these batteries afterwards as well? I mean, our batteries have been lasting a lot longer. Um, so it's a little bit difficult sometimes to get some of these batteries, but even here locally in the markets, I'm already talking to a lot of stakeholders in terms of what do we, what can we do with second life battery? Because, um, there is life, uh, after the vehicle as well. And how do we make sure that we use it in a positive way? So from a, a regulatory support as I said earlier, uh, I think we 100% agree, just public and private sector really working together to achieve a common goal. Um, and, and we really need to start exploring um, incentives and how do we, uh, what policies need to change and how do we really work together to make sure that this industry gets boosted, both from producing and manufacturing here locally to uh, what gets brought into the market, um, so yeah, there's 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 a lot of of work there, and that was that's really one thing that I would want to change if I could is is really just um, trying to push the policies a little bit more. We know that it takes a lot of time, um, but I think that's really going to be the tipping point for this market. Charging infrastructure, so really just scaling awareness and visibility. As I said earlier, there is quite a lot of charging infrastructure in markets. Not everybody's really aware of the amount of charging infrastructure, and that really comes down to awareness and visibility. And really just exploring various forms of energy supply. So everybody always thinks it comes straight from the grid. And the fact is, is that um, not necessarily, I, I work with a lot of uh, suppliers that don't necessarily use the grid. They're completely off grid. They're using solar, they're using wind. It's actually quite fantastic to see. And education, I think this is probably one of the biggest things. There are a lot of misconceptions and there's a lot of misinformation around electric vehicles, especially within South Africa. Um, so, I think we all kind of just striving towards continuously growing uh, awareness of electric mobility and what does that actually mean? And really just encouraging people to experience the various forms of electric mobility. So um, there's not, there isn't just cars anymore. I mean, you, you've got scooters and all of these sorts of things that are coming into the market, which is very, very exciting. And the fact is, is electric is really, it starts to become a lifestyle and we need to start looking at how do we boost that? Because electric is a lifestyle. And so with South Africa, we've got a lot of advantages. It can definitely work. So that is, is definitely something that uh, I look forward to driving even from our side. Um, with that said, I think, yeah, for that said, I think let's play a video and then we'll do a Q and A. The IX has the role of uh, being a pinnacle, a technical lighthouse. A courageous approach to transfer the BMW Group into the future. The way we design the products goes a little deeper. We created the car from the inside out. A very focused view on what our customers want. The exterior is monolithic. Simple and very modern. Every detail is designed to blend in with the sculpture. We try to approach some sort of wow effect. Some people even said this is not a BMW. It's more the philosophical approach, how we want to integrate all these high-tech possibilities into a more human interaction or scenario. It is reduced, clean, yet warm and welcome. Just imagine if you only draw a single stroke, it will be very conspicuous. 
if you have more, you don't know where to look. Yeah, we did try out different ways of thinking like a startup. Think big. Bold, 20 people, freaky ideas. We start from scratch. Fail quick, learn fast. It is like regaining the feeling of having just graduated. Draw what I think, think without boundaries. To pioneer themes and questions that will come up. The IX takes the I fleet a big step forward. It is a pathfinder. I don't believe that emotions will disappear in the future. We don't stop to love, we don't stop to hate. And we will use all these new technologies in a healthy and meaningful way. The future will be bright and positive. Let's go inside. We try to create a design where we start from the customer and we develop the car from the inside to the outside. Human-centric design puts people into center stage. When I started the design process of the iX interior, I began with the approach of really questioning every element in this car um, and really asking myself, does the car need this? Um, and if it didn't, I took it out. Perfect space on wheels is inviting, it's inspiring, and it's relaxing at the same time. It's a space that invites you to come in, to bring your friends, bring your family, a space that is open, that is light-flooded and very airy. Everything was more like, okay, how you feel more comfortable inside the car. A place that is uplifting and cozy at the same time. Especially in the interior, we really started with the approach of designing everything more like a living room interior. Armchairs, sofas, tables. We're not designing a car, but we're designing a living space. A truly purpose-built architecture. We didn't just settle for making a pretty looking car. And throughout the process, all of our disciplines, they really merged. We basically reinvented the company regarding processes. For me, the future of mobility is very cozy, welcoming and feels like a second home. We do have a lot of responsibility in uh, taking care of resources which we use since we are strongly connected to our environment. We were able to use recycled materials and develop them into the highest level of luxury. I think we have to give back. We have to make sure that we leave a little footprint behind for the next generations. Sustainability is not only a buzzword, it's an attitude. Let's make the future bright, positive and simple. Well, Klesha, thank you very much. I mean, it, it very excellent presentation, a lot, lot of information, a lot, lot, lot for us to digest. And I think you've answered a lot of the questions because you, you kind of knew what the questions were going to be. Uh, we, we had them coming through and we kind of been, been, been seeing the answers as you present. The, the one question which I do have, and, and, and two of our viewers have raised it, and I, I also picked it up, and I, I need to ask this question, is that one of your earlier slides, you showed a prediction, you know, 20, you talk about 2030, 2040, um, massive, you know, big numbers of, of EVs. Um, what what we've seen from what you presented now is a little bit of a different picture to what perhaps the government and, and, and in particular you know ESCOM and guys spoke about yesterday. Can you can you give some, some input? I know you can't advise on on what they're doing, but is there is there a a misalignment? Is is is, is government and OEMs kind of OEMs over here and governments over here? And how do we get that everyone's talking on the same prediction? Because I think your stats maybe are talking a lot more what we could expect. Um, and, and, and you know, there just seems to be a difference between the two kind of modeling profiles. I don't know, I don't know, if, you, you know if you can maybe comment on that. Sure. So um, firstly, there's a lot of research out there. Everybody's doing research all the time. 
Um, so the first thing I would obviously say is just making sure we're looking at the same sources. I think for the first time, and I know that you have Gaylor after my presentation as well. So for the first time, we actually did some independent research within the market as well. So I think what's great is we've always had a lot of these stats that are coming out of a lot of the European markets. And uh, we really needed something that looked at the local market specifically. So I know Gala will speak into a little bit more detail. And the reason why I talk about Gala and tips is because obviously I sit on the NAMSA committee and that's where a lot of the OEMs are sitting. So the fact is a lot of the OEMs are sitting together. We're all around the table. We're all talking about the electric vehicle industry and we're all trying to say, guys, well, how do we work together and how do we lobby together with government? How do we make sure that we very clear from an OEM perspective in terms of what it is that we need to drive this industry. Um, so that is something that is currently happening. Uh, so the fact is, is that when it comes to an OEM's uh, perspective, we're all sitting on NAMSA, we're all kind of aligned. Um, but at the same time, what's really happening is um, the government is also starting to really start to look at this and saying it's actually coming a lot sooner than we actually think it is. Um, but I think we also need to start getting to a point where, yes, we can lobby and lobby, but we need to just make sure that at some point in time we're working towards a common goal. So um, I think the OEMs are very clear in terms of what it is that we want, um, the type of research that have, that's been done, and that's why you start to bring in independent researchers such as TIPS right now. Um, they've done some fantastic research in terms of the, the country itself. Um, and I think that's probably the, the most accurate that we've seen. A lot of the times we're looking at uh, international uh, types of uh, research and really starting to say, how do we think it's going to look here locally? Um, it's also really a tipping point in terms of when do these policies really come in? Because we can lobby all day long, but if policies Absolutely. only really come in in 10 years time, that will be our tipping point. If the policies come in a lot faster, then the 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 tipping point changes. Sure, so, 100%. Um, I think it's the fact of we have to be prepared and we need to be flexible and we just need to make sure that we're all working towards the same goal, I think, is that at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Devon, I know oh, plenty of questions. And hi, Klesha, again. Always, always great hi, to connect. <laughs> um, well, well done. I mean, you guys have been putting money and resources and effort into EVs for a long time. Uh, I was one of the privileged few to have... Uh, to have driven the, that Mini E test car about 10 years ago and now to see the Mini E on the road and to think, wow, all that time, all that development and now we've got a great car with a great battery and uh, there's a product on the road. So well done and big respect. Uh, first question, and there's many questions, but the first question, uh, iX3, when can we expect that to be launched in the market? So we'll see iX3 in uh, quarter one uh, next year. You might see a few floating around later this year, okay. <laughs> but uh, for the customers, we'll see it in the beginning of next year. Wow, because in my opinion, uh, uh, the other challenge in terms of the low EV volumes is that we've not had a practical EV as yet, a car like an iX3, you know, so a car that you can live with, a car with a big enough range, a car that can transport your family, etc. Uh, and now for the first time there's a BMW option uh, where one can happily live with a car. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, please, please just confirm though, will that car be built in South Africa or fully imported? Uh, so maybe just uh, for a differentiation purposes, remember there's the iX yes. and then there's the iX3. Yeah. So there's actually two. Yeah. So we'll actually see the iX first, you'll okay. see the iX this year. Um, and then you'll see the iX3. Um, I think we sometimes get excited about the iX3 because the X3 is, is locally uh, made here currently. So um, currently in terms of the vehicles that were coming, no, they will not be made here. Um, but who knows? Yes. In my opinion, that's where we need to get to. And obviously it is what it is. And uh, the big OEMs at an international level will decide which country and which plant builds which cars. Uh, but I'm coming from the space of we need to get our plants in our country geared up for EV production and full EV mm -hmm. production and not just, you know, uh, we do the normal production and then the EV comes from another country. And hopefully BMW can be the leader again, you know, in this, in this regard on this topic and we can get the industry going into a level where we are ready to build EVs and export 
and not just important. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, we've been producing for a very long time. Um, I mean, we, we don't think about today and tomorrow. We always think 10 years, 20 years ahead because you obviously need to ramp up a lot of your production. Um, but I mean, I think it comes back down to also just getting a lot of support. We need to make sure that we also, um, as we plan, increase a lot of skill sets. Um, and, and we really just need to start working with governments a lot more because it takes a lot of investment to upgrade um, a lot of these plants. And uh, yes, you can do it out of your own, but also there comes a point where, where public sector and private sector really, really need to start working together. Yeah, and and I think I think that's a great point, uh, Clayshan. I mean, obviously, you, the, the OEMs like BMW, you can't produce in every country around the world because every country is probably asking the same thing. Um, and I think that you've raised a great point, and we have to have that partnership. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is that we you, you've spoken a lot about the infrastructure and the education with the infrastructure. Um, Currently on the ground, you know, BMW in terms of infrastructure, uh, what is currently there and what is the, what is the plans to uh, improve that infrastructure? Because I think there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Now, what comes first, the vehicles or the infrastructure? Um, can you maybe give us a little bit of insight on, on, on BMW's uh, thinking and planning around that? Sure. So BMW has been investing in charging infrastructure for a long time. Um, one thing that I must say is that uh, customer behavior actually shows that 70% of charging actually happens at home. Mm -hmm. So we've invested um, both in terms of um, partnerships and bringing suppliers on board, both from a, a home charging front and from a public, public charging infrastructure perspective. So we've invested a lot. Uh, we'll see a lot of our charging stations. Uh, well, we started with our dealerships. We then have a lot of um, companies that approach us, a lot of partners um, that we invest in charging infrastructure together as well. So we have a lot of charging infrastructure at malls, uh, the airports, the three major airports. So Oa Tambo, King Sharka International and Cape Town International. So we have a lot of charging infrastructure, a lot of these main um, places as well. We know that there's a lot of people and other companies that are in the market right now also in terms of putting up charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we're very much aware of that, but it's not necessarily about a competition thing. It's about the fact that this is great. It's fantastic to see them. I wish I could see more mm -hmm. because it's, it's really just a perception and a mindset because South Africans are so used to seeing petrol stations yeah, yeah. and maybe the visibility and awareness of the charging infrastructure is probably not sufficient at this point in time. Even though it is available, um, that probably needs to be worked on. And only once you're in the EV space, do you see it. Yeah. But I think wh what I'm talking about when you get to education and awareness is really the people that are outside of the EV space. Yeah. Because once you get into an electric car, you see all the charging stations, your navigation changes completely, your world kind of changes completely. But uh, the normal um, petrol diesel driving consumer doesn't see that. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot difficult. It's a lot more difficult to almost persuade them or turn them over because for them, it's like, well, I can't see them. So I don't know where they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really where the, the education really needs to come in. 100%. Yeah. So, so Klesha, uh, unfortunately, I mean, I think we've got, we've got, we've got loads of questions and we, maybe we can have another follow-up session with you at yeah. another time. Um, as you mentioned, we have got Gaylor on the line, so he's going to be coming through shortly. Um, I've got one quick question and I, I think it's, you, I, I can probably predict your answer, but again, if you as, as, as basically the head of e-mobility for BMW, what is the, the one big thing that you think in the next 12 months we have to get right in order to speed up the adoption of EVs? If, if, if someone said to you, Klesha, here's a, here's a deck of cards, you can choose anything. What is the one big thing that you think will make the most fundamental difference to seeing more EVs and the, the rate of adoption changing in South Africa? You're probably going to predict my answer, but I'm going to say policy. 100%. <laughs> um, I think the policy is going to be the make or break here. Um, in, in most of the markets that are that are really uh, developed and that are that are selling EVs in numbers that we can't even imagine right now, um, it was it's because the policies have been put in place. Okay. So I mean, our policies need to change all the way from definition to. Um, 
different uh, structures for the companies that are importing versus companies that are manufacturing within the markets. Um, so there's quite a lot that, that needs to change from a policy perspective. Um, but I think the minute that changes, the game changes. Fantastic. And then you'll start yeah. to see. Well, I think, I think, as you said, I mean, we're going to have to have a follow-up session with you maybe yes, in six yes. months' time when a few of those more models are, are nearly are, are, are seaward-bound to our shores. But um, it's been an absolute pleasure, Klesha. You, you, you know, gave us a lot of insight, you know, giving us a lot of uh, tidbits and you know, models that we can expect to see in South Africa, which is exciting. I think we're all excited to see a lot more EVs on the road, and, and especially with, uh, with, that, with that famous BMW badge. So, you know, from myself, Rob, uh, and Devon, yeah. thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, guys. Have soon. a great day. Have a lovely day, Klesha. Have a good morning. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. So Go I on. think, Devon, you know, great, great privilege for us to have, a, have an OEM, a head of an OEM's department on e-mobility talking to us. I think, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of questions. Guys, you know, saying, oh, the cost of vehicles, this and that. And I think what we need to appreciate is that OEMs can't answer all those questions Definitely. all at once. Definitely. And, and especially one OEM on its own. Exactly. And they have their own challenges. And it's all about budget. And they've got their own, you know, uh, their own issues that, sure. you know, as well. And it's going to take a team effort now as we, as we move into the new, into the new, uh, new technology. Yeah. And I think people need to see charging stations at shopping malls, at gyms, etc. So it's much more visible in their daily life routine. Yes. Because right now it's in dealerships, it's at airports, etc. And who's really going to charge? Mm. Uh, so, uh, so once that happens, and once the policies change, we're yes. going to see that shift. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, you know, obviously policy. And I think that the, the, the ties in quite nicely. Um, I think the one thing that really struck me, which is, which is really important, I think you alluded to yesterday, and it's been alluded to, is that there, there, there is definitely different data out there. And I, I, Klesha's model is looking at 58% by 2040. You know, that, that's a huge number. Um, I think it's going to be really important, and I'm not quite sure how we do it, but that kind of privately sourced data and research, it, it has to be shared or passed on to government. You know, people at ESCOM need to have access to that data because we can't have our, our energy provider on one side, you know, dare I say predicting a curve that's like this, and, an, and a big OEM predicting a curve is like this. Yes. Um, you know, somewhere there's going to be a there's going to be a change. Absolutely. And it's and going to be important that we get everyone on the same page, so to speak. Absolutely. And uh, BMW is a premium player, so therefore, relatively speaking, low volume. Once the Toyotas and the VWs hit the market with their EVs, then you're going to see a proper change in those volumes. Sure. And uh, then Escom and all of us need to be ready for it. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think it's going to be critical that we that somehow we get this knowledge sharing going between the different groups and, and, and everyone starts speaking the same, the same language because everyone's saying the same thing. Policy, policy, policy. Yeah. But policy can only be done when it's based on information and the right information. Yeah. And if the right information isn't with government, then the policy is not going to be correct. Absolutely. And so, they all need to be sing, singing off the same hymn book, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so we can all therefore plan accordingly because I see, you know, everyone has a plan. So what's the target? What's the volumes? And then at least we all try trying to hit those targets. Yeah, agreed. So that, that was Klesha Johnson, our manager of electromobility and on-demand mobility solutions for BMW Group South Africa. Our next speaker that she alluded to is Gaylor Montmassin-Claire. He is the Senior Economist for Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies for TIPS, and he's exploring policy options to support the EV value chain development in South Africa. We're going to take a quick two minute break while we get Gaylor set in and, and online and ready. And then we'll come back. And I think this is going to be one that everyone wants to hear about. Everyone's talking about policy, policy, policy. policy. Hopefully Gaylor can show us some answers on how we can yeah. get the policy right. And he can tell us when. 100%. Yeah. Perfect. We'll see you guys in about two minutes.